From their hearty exchanges and playful jokes amongst themselves, it is difficult to imagine that these mostly young men are planning murder on a large scale. But so confident of success were members of the Jesh Ayman, a terror cell operating within Boni Forest, that they had time to videotape themselves minutes to the attack. But the hugs turned out to be goodbye hugs, as hours later, at least 16 of them lay dead, having been mauled by the Kenya Defense Forces, who had intelligence report of the attack. <laughs> Among those killed was the terrorist commander, Lukman Osman, and the British national, Thomas Evans, who is believed to have been taking the video. How did Thomas Evans go from a pub-going electrician in High Wycombe to an Al-Shabaab terrorist in Somalia with a 13-year-old bride? This is the story of the terror unleashed on Kenya and the steadfast resolution of its people to remain standing and fighting. Born in 1990 to Sally Evans and her husband, Thomas was raised in High Wycombe, Buckinghamshire village. Thomas and his younger brother Michael Evans were raised in a non-religious household. It is said that Thomas was a loving and mild-mannered child who was always happy. The family had happy and contented lives until Thomas's father left when he was in secondary school and things changed for the worse. He was working abroad and he revealed that he had started another family abroad and left Thomas, Michael and their mother for that other family. Things became very hard for Sally and her children as they struggled with the abandonment and the emotional torture they felt. Thomas would soon start getting involved in petty crime and this caused him and his brother to drift apart. His brother would later say in an interview that he was easily influenced by others and it seemed like he was looking for something special, maybe a family, since theirs was broken. In his teens, Thomas would meet a girl that he fell deeply in love with, but the relationship would not last as they broke up a year after. Thomas was devastated and felt abandoned once again. He remembered his father's betrayal, the heartbreak and felt unloved and empty. His mother Sally would say that he seemed lost at this point in his life and so in searching for fulfillment and purpose, he would soon convert to Islam at age 19 and change his name to Abdul Hakim. Upon his conversion, Thomas changed. He attempted to convert his mother and brother to Islam but failed. He refused to use the same crockery and cutlery as the rest of his family and resented music being played in their home. He would also not enter the front room during Christmas. One day, Thomas brought home a friend, Donald Stuart White, a fellow Muslim convert. Stuart White was arrested in 2006 in connection with the liquid bomb plot to blow up planes but was later cleared of any involvement. They both attended the Muslim Education Center, a mosque in High Wycombe. It is at this same mosque that the members of the 2006 liquid bomb plot worshipped, although the center has denied radicalizing its youth. Now, I don't claim to be an expert in radicalization, but in an attempt to understand Thomas, I did some research on his background and those of other infamous converts to Islam who later became terrorists, and the findings were similar. In my view, the recruiters took full advantage of Thomas's vulnerability to recruit him into a terrorist organization. His unresolved abandonment issues made him psychologically vulnerable and easier to bend to their will. Also, the fact that Thomas had grown up without religion worked in their favor as Thomas did not have anything to compare radical Islam teachings to. He knew nothing of other religions and their teachings, and he was therefore unable to see the evil and deadly side of radical Islam. Religion gives hope and a sense of family and togetherness, which is exactly what the recruiters knew he needed and gave him. Thomas must have been manipulated to feel as if he was accepted, loved, included, and like he'd found his forever family. He must have felt that he'd never be abandoned again and felt relieved of his past traumas for the first time in his life. He must have felt indebted to them for accepting him into their religious family and must have been eager to please. So Thomas immersed himself in the most radical teachings of Islam and failed to recognize that he was being brainwashed into pursuing a murderous cause. 
His attitude changed. He grew a beard. He frequently fought with his mother and brother. He cut off all his friends and made new friends at the mosque. And he even tried to fight his boss at work. He would soon lose his job as an electrician and Thomas would attribute losing his job to the fact that he had converted to Islam, but this was not the case. He'd lost his job because he was insubordinate and was no longer employable because of his attitude. He soon got another job through the mosque and the company he worked for had links to jihadists who are now senior members of ISIS. As Thomas's belief hardened, he became very secretive so very little is known about his recruitment. His brother said a tipping point came when Evans went on a charity trip in 2010 to Palestine called Road to Hope, from which he returned angry with strong views against the UK and US presence in the Middle East. His mother found a helpline for people with concerns that their relatives or friends were being radicalized but felt ignored because she was not a Muslim. Six months before joining Al-Shabaab, Thomas went to Gaza, but in 2011, Thomas left home and said he was traveling to Egypt to learn Arabic. A few weeks later, he called his mother saying he was in Somalia and had joined Al-Shabaab. He said he was now a jihadist and when his mother asked how he had become one, he said Allah led him. His mother then said that she would like to meet that Allah, to which he responded and said that she will not because she was a kafir and that she was going to hell. On 24th December 2012, Thomas calls to tell his mom that he is married a 13-year-old girl on 20th December. She doesn't speak English, but he is happy. Her name is Sauda. His wife Sauda would later on severally call Thomas's mother asking for money, which she would always refuse to send because if she did, she would have been indicted for supporting terrorism. On 21st December 2013, masked gunmen attacked the Westgate shopping mall, an upmarket mall in Nairobi. The attack resulted in 71 total deaths, including 62 civilians and 5 Kenyan soldiers. All gunmen were killed by the Kenya Defense Forces. Approximately 200 people were wounded in the massacre. Thomas called his mother to boast about the Westgate mall massacre. He told his mother that he wished he was part of the crew or the militia that performed the killings but unfortunately he wasn't allowed to go because they considered him not ready yet. His mother recalled being very angry and disappointed in him and the fact that he was happy others had suffered but his response was that they deserved it as they were kafirs. Even though Thomas was not directly involved in the Westgate Mall massacre, he would be eager to participate in the following terror attacks and he did. On 15th June 2014, more than 60 people were killed in attacks in Mbeketoni. About 50 masked gunmen hijacked a van and raided a police station in the predominantly Christian town of Mbeketoni. The gunmen then shot men at random as women were forced to watch. Thomas and another British terrorist, the White Widow, were involved. Eyewitnesses later say that Thomas slaughtered the men while their wives watched, then took out his camera and recorded them being shot. The assailants also banned hotel, restaurants, and government offices. It is also reported that help arrived 10 hours late despite the military camp being just 30 kilometers away from Peketoni town. This was a testament to poor policing and the failure of the police and security institutions in Peketoni to protect its citizens. This led to angry protests against the police and their inaction when the citizens were in dire need. On 17 June 2014, Kenya Defense Forces killed five Al-Shabaab militia caught escaping out of Peketoni, but an undisclosed number of them escaped. This, however, did little to calm the angry citizens and the then Kenya police commissioner was fired. Thomas also assisted in the massacre at the Garissa University in 2015. On 2nd April 2015, gunmen stormed the Garissa University College in Garissa, killing 148 students and injuring at least 79. The militant groups Al-Qaeda and Al-Shabaab, which the gunmen claimed to belong to, took responsibility for the attack. The gunmen freed Muslims and killed those who identified as Christians. The siege ended the same day when all four of the attackers were killed. Five men were later arrested in connection with the attack and a bounty was placed for the arrest of the organizer. 
the Kenya Defense Forces acted swiftly with air raids over targeted Al Shabaab hotspots in Somalia, froze bank accounts of those transferring money to Somalia, reinforced the blockade at the border of Kenya and Somalia, and issued a 20 million Kenyan shillings bounty on the head of the Al Shabaab leader, dead or alive. The Kenya Defense Force and the Ministry of Interior also enhanced security operations in Garissa. The Al Shabaab leader of the Kenyan attacks would soon be killed by the Kenya Defense Force a few months later. This attack touched hearts across the world, and students of the Zagreb University in Croatia lay on the ground for hours to honor the 148 students killed in this massacre. A monument was also built in the school in remembrance of the innocent lives lost. Later at an interview, Sally, when asked how she would feel if her son was killed, was quoted saying the following, It will be easier if he dies because then I'll know he can't hurt anyone else. But at the same time, it wouldn't be easier because my son would be gone. But then I guess my son is already gone anyway. Four years and four days after last seeing her son, Sally saw a picture of her son on Twitter that shocked her. The video below shows Thomas and the Al Shabaab celebrating in anticipation of the innocent lives they were going to take the next day. On 14th of June 2015, Thomas and the Al Shabaab snuck into a KDF camp in the wee hours of the morning, seeking to murder every soldier in sight. The KDF, however, had received intelligence and knew they were coming. A fierce firefight ensued and the Al Shabaab militians were killed. Thomas recorded the whole incident, including when he was shot and killed by a sniper. After receiving the news of their son and brother's death, Sally and Michael were devastated but also glad that he was dead and could not hurt anyone anymore. In an interview later on, Michael would say that he hated Thomas for what he had done and the pain he had brought to his family and other families around the world. Both Michael and his mother continued to try to come to terms with Thomas's actions and all the horrible crimes that he committed against innocents in Kenya. Sally later said that Thomas is rotting in hell for what he had done. Thomas Evans was buried in Kenya by the Kenya Defense Forces in an undisclosed and unmarked grave. His mother said that he had told her he would never return to the UK and so his wish was granted. Reeling from the aftermath of her son's actions, Sally decided to fight radicalization by telling her story. To this day, she attends and helps organize fundraisers for counter-extremism organizations and has become an advocate for counter-extremism. Guys, this was a hard story for me today. The images I saw while researching brought me to tears several times. I cannot imagine what the families of the victims felt and are still feeling. Please tell me, what do you think about this story? I hope that you have taken a few insights from the story on how terrorist recruits target their victims and would hopefully protect your children and families from this deadly brainwashing. Despite the pain and loss that the people of Kenya have endured at the hands of the Al-Shabaab, we continue in our unwavering fight against terrorism. We fight for our right to live in safety and our right to live free, happy lives. Numerous subsequent attacks have been quelled by our Kenya Defense Forces, but we recognize that the war is not yet done. And therefore, we are committed to do whatever it takes to protect ourselves, our children, and our families. This story aims to bring to light the atrocities committed by terrorists by speaking against radicalization and honoring the lives of our brave fallen brothers and sisters who were taken from us way too soon. May their souls rest in eternal and perfect peace and their deaths never go unpunished.